Welcome to today's Healthline webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients, titled The Essential Role of Diet in Supporting Kidney Health. Thank you for joining us for this National Kidney Month event. My name is Jerome Bailey. I'm AKP's Director of Patient Engagement and Advocacy, and I'm pleased to be the moderator of today's program. As the oldest and largest fully independent patient-led kidney patient organization in the U.S., AAKP is proud to host our webinar series as a service to our fellow kidney patients, family members, and care partners, healthcare professionals, researchers, and policymakers. AAKP's Healthline and Healthline Innovator webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and care partner education is an integral part of an individual's treatment, and to that end, AAKP is a champion for full patient care choice, the protection of the patient-doctor relationship, and the elimination of artificial barriers and government determinants of health that impede patient care choice and access to available treatment options. At AAKP, we work to ensure that patients have a central role in the research and innovation process so that unmet needs are identified and unique patient insights and lived experiences are part of the overall design to determine optimal approaches and strategies for the development of and access to new products. To garner patient insights, AAK built this center with the latest polling and engagement technologies, so kidney patients are also at the core of informing federal, academic, and private sectors in shaping the next generation of health care services, assistance programs, and innovative new treatments. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities that you receive via email as a member of AAKP to make your voice heard. To begin our program, as we all know, diet and nutrition play a crucial role in helping to manage kidney health and preventing co-related complications associated with kidney disease, such as fluid overload or increased nutrient levels like protein and phosphorus. By making informed dietary choices that are right for your needs, individuals can help maintain optimal kidney function and improve their overall well-being. In the weeks running up to today's webinar, AAKP launched a food and nutrition flash survey through our Center for Patient Research and Education, and I'd like to share some of those results. Respondents were individuals across the kidney disease spectrum, from CKD to dialysis to transplant recipients. 80% of respondents confirmed that they have been told by their physician that due to their kidney disease, they must modify the foods they eat. With that, Potassium and sodium intake were the top two nutrient patients responded, respondents were told to monitor. On a scale of one to five, with one being poor and five being excellent, respondents ranked themselves at a four for their ability to follow their kidney-friendly diet, which is a positive. However, knowing how important a dietitian specializing in kidney disease can be to help a patient start off on the right foot with their kidney-friendly kidney diet, only about half of respondents indicated they have ever had an appointment with a dietitian. An impressive 90% of respondents indicate, hit, indicated that they do read food nutrition labels when they shop, which is important to identify any hidden potassium and phosphorus in packaged foods. Overall, the survey results were positive that kidney patients are doing their part in following a kidney-friendly diet, but are others holding up their end of the deal? A recent proposal, a recent proposed rule by the Food and Drug Administration could change the game and has sparked concern throughout the entire kidney community. If approved, this rule would permit the use of salt substitutes in foods that are that adhere to specific standards of identity which dictate the ingredients allowed in popular foods such as bagels, crackers, and pasta. Currently, food manufacturers are prohibited from using salt substitutes in these products due to regulations that specifically require the use of table salt. 
AAKP, along with our allied partners at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic and the National Kidney Foundation, issued a joint statement expressing concern regarding the potential negative impact of these proposals on kidney patients, particularly Black Americans who have historically faced higher rates of kidney disease. While AAKP and our allies support the F F FDA's effort to reduce sodium intake for overall health benefits, there is widespread concern throughout the kidney community about the potential risks of change since salt substitutes commonly include potassium chloride. For people with chronic kidney disease, an increased potassium level can lead to serious health issues like cardiac arrhythmias and heart failure. In the February 1st issue of Epoch Health, AAKP's Medical Advisory Board Chair, Dr. Stephen Fadem, and AAKP's Chair of Policy and Global Affairs, Paul Conway, urged the FDA to consult with the kidney community before moving forward with this proposal. They emphasized the importance of protecting kidney patients and taxpayers from any potential health risks that could arise from overlooking the needs of this vulnerable population. You can read their comments by going to the links now showing on your screen. You can also access additional articles published on the issue, as well as the joint letter submitted by AAKP, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and the National Kidney Foundation via, via the links now showing. With this critical issue facing American kidney patients, AAKP asked the final question within our flash survey. If the FDA amended current standards of identity, SOIs, for food manufacturers that permitted the use of potassium-based salt substitutes in foods for which salt is a required or optional ingredient, do you think this decision would negatively impact individuals with complex medical conditions, such as kidney disease and heart disease, who are required to monitor their potassium intake due to their increased risk for hypokalemia or high potassium which can cause cardiac arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. An overwhelming number of respondents, more than 70% said yes. AAKP will continue to monitor this issue and alert you to updates as well as opportunities to raise your voice on this issue to inform the FDA that this un uninformed decision negatively impacts the kidney disease community and would be a prime example of a government determinant of health. Stay tuned for more information as AAKP gears up for the National Potassium Awareness Day, May 1st. Moving on, we have two great speakers today, beginning with Anna Marie Rodriguez. Anna Marie has worked as a nephrology dietitian for over 25 years in a variety of settings, from clinical to pharmaceutical, including sales, education, and renal med medical affairs. She is currently an independent consultant, the owner of Nutrition Directions LLC, and employed by Pentec Health as a renal clinical retention specialist. She has served and chaired several boards, including the South and Central Texas National Kidney Foundation Medical Advisory Board, San Antonio Council of Renal Nutrition, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Renal Practice Group, and several groups within the Dietetic Practice Group. Anna Marie is no stranger to AAKP. She was an original reviewer of AAKP's popular Delicious program, which features over 100 kidney-friendly recipes. Anna Marie, I will turn the program over to you. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, and I am very appreciative of the, of the chance opportunity to talk about one of my favorite things, or two of my favorite things, kidneys and nutrition. So without further ado, let's begin. So we're going to talk about nutrition and we don't need to talk about my disclosure. So we're going to focus on the complexities of the diet. And there's a lot of them. Anytime you talk about nutrition and kidneys, there's a lot of complexities and we're going to break those down a little bit. And hopefully we'll come away feeling like it's a piece of cake. It's easy. More than half of the treatment of CKD is through nutrition intervention. And when I saw the poll that was shared earlier about, about half, 
person seeing a dietitian, it's a little alarming. We want to see more persons seeing a dietitian because nutrition plays such a vital role in the care of kidneys and why it's to help maintain kidney function by reducing the protein intake. This helps to decrease creatinine and uremic toxins, the waste that's in the blood. If you're not familiar with what creatinine is, it's a waste product. An example, it's a, a byproduct of muscle metabolism. If someone's working out, doing a lot of weightlifting, um, they're gonna have a little bit more creatinine in their blood because it's some muscle breakdown. That's not a big issue unless your kidneys aren't functioning, then that creatinine cannot be eliminated. It's gonna build up in the blood. So following a, a kidney friendly diet is essential to maintain the health of the kidneys. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Plato diet, plant dominant low protein diet for persons with kidney disease today. We'll get into that a little bit more in just a bit. Before we begin though, it's important to know your number. I'll use myself as an example. In stage two, that's about where I'm at. And I am monitoring this super closely because we need to know what our number is in order to identify what we need to do with our diet and to preserve our kidney function. What can make this worse is knowing if we have protein in our urine. If there's just a little bit or none, it's mild, a little bit more, as we can see, that goes up, the risk goes up, and then severely increased a lot of protein in the urine, then you can see this risk is vastly increased. So we want to know what our numbers are at all times. Keep your appointments with your doctor and for your lab work. The ultimate goals of nutrition intervention with CKD is to both minimize the risks that are associated with kidney disease and to stop the progression. As I said, we're going to talk about the plant dominant low protein diet. And as you can see, it's 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. And before I go further, that's actually a normal protein intake. So what makes this really special? It's the fact that it's over 50% plant-based protein, which means it's an alkaline intake. Whenever we're eating more plants, that's more alkaline and it's kidney protective. Whenever we're eating a higher amount of plants, it's a lower sodium diet as well, and it's higher in fiber, which now we know, well, we've known this for years, that fiber is actually kidney protective as well. Our kidneys are amazing organs. Not only, not only do they make the urine and clear the wastes from our body, they're basically taking out the trash, but they help preserve uh, chemical balance within our blood. They help make red blood cells, keep our bones strong, and they help control our blood pressure. So what do we need to do to keep our kidneys as healthy as possible? We need to know if we have risk factors, we need to stay informed. We must be active, eat a healthy diet, maintain blood sugar, blood pressure, and keep hydrated. Don't smoke. If you smoke, please do try to stop smoking. We now know definitely that smoking is directly correlated with kidney disease. And don't take NSAIDs or painkillers if not necessary. If you're on NSAIDs or painkillers, then speak to your doctor and see if there's any alternative uh, solutions that you can use. That's what harmed me. Get your kidney function checked as much as your doctor says. If you have hypertension or diabetes, know your number. It's especially important. If you're ever wondering, about education material, go to the AAKP Healthline. There's so much education, a vast variety of resources just waiting for you to tap into, including those wonderful recipes. So exactly how much protein do we, do we need? There's a lot of numbers here and I'll break this down. So go all the way down to the bottom. Adults with CKD stage three to five who are not on dialysis and have diabetes, the protein needs are just a little bit higher. 0.6 to 0.8 grams. And that is the same as what I just spoke about with the Plato diet. And realistically, that is exactly what the average person needs. We don't need more than 0.8 grams per kilogram unless we're a growing child or oh, we have wounds or we're an athlete doing intense workouts. But other than that, we don't need more protein than that. If we are stage CKD three to five, not on dialysis, then look towards the middle. This is highly recommended with the newer 2020 guidelines for nutrition, a low protein diet of 0.55 to 0.6 grams per kilogram. That's actually a low protein diet. And 
a very low protein diet of 0.228, sorry, to 0.43 grams per kilogram. By now you're probably thinking, okay, this is a lot of numbers, but what does this actually mean? What does this look like? If you were following a 0.28 to 0.43 grams per kilogram, that's only about two or three ounces of protein each day. So think in terms of that, and I'll show you some protein samples in just a moment so you can kind of visualize what this might look like. But for those persons who have CKD that are on dialysis, then those needs almost double up to 1.0 to 1.2 grams per kilogram. Just to give you that example of how much protein does this actually equate, you could easily have one egg or a tofu scramble for breakfast, a serving of beans for lunch, and a small amount of protein for dinner, and that would be a day supply. Look at the palm of your hand to see what a serving size of protein is. A half of that is going to be approximately two ounces. And some of you may have a larger hand. Well, if you have a larger hand, then you're typically gonna be a larger person and you're gonna have larger protein needs because your protein needs are going to be based on your, your body weight. So that's okay, still go with that train of thought, half of the palm of your hand. If you keep your protein to 10 to 15 grams at each meal or less, you're going to be fine. So what's the verdict, plant or animal protein? The verdict is not set. Uh, with those new 2020 guidelines, it, there was no established guideline as far as should it be plants or should it be animals? Uh, what type of protein is better? There's a lot of research and literature that says plant protein is is best for kidney health because of its alkaline nature, it's kidney protective, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the verdict is definitely in when it concerns red meat and processed meat. So avoid red and processed meat at all costs, not just for your kidneys, but for your, your heart and for diabetes as well. So those we do know about for sure. If you really are wanting to uh, enjoy animal-based proteins, fish, especially fatty fish, is a good source of omega-3, especially salmon, tuna, mackerel, uh, whereas bass, cod, tilapia, those have lower fats, so lower omega-3s. Why do we need omega-3s? Omega-3s are a good source of fatty acids that support heart health. And if we're following a very strict plant-based diet, then we want to get omega-3s from some sources such as these, flaxseed, hemp seeds or chia seeds, even walnuts or canola oil will provide omega-3 fatty acids. You may need a supplement as well, depending on how strict you are with your diet. I did mention a very low protein diet and that is very restrictive. If we're only eating about two or three ounces a day of protein, we're not gonna get enough protein to keep ourselves healthy. That's very minimal. The only way that that's actually going to be healthy is if we use keto analogs with that to keep our bodies in protein balance. And I want to point out that keto analogs have nothing to do with the keto diet or with ketosis. They are simply, I bet you didn't think we were gonna think of chemistry today, but what they are is amino acids without the nitrogen attached to the side chain. The nitrogen is gone, so there's no nitrogenous waste. So therefore, the body can stay in protein balance without any nitrogen waste product building up. They are available in the United States without a prescription. You can buy those online, but I will be straightforward with you. They are a little bit on the expensive side. So going the route of a low protein diet with plants may be less expensive. So what happens when we do eat too much protein? It causes a heavy workload on the kidneys, which can cause further damage in, in regards to our kidney function. It, increases waste in the blood, which results in uremia, and it can cause metabolic acidosis, which we know is now a consequence, meaning if our kidney function is declining, we can have too much acid in our blood because the kidneys can't get rid of it, but it also causes damage to the kidneys, so it becomes a little bit of a cycle there. So let's talk a little bit more about alkalinity or acidity. Acid production in the body comes mainly from diet, especially the Western diet, which favors animal-based proteins. And it's not so much that if we eat a little bit, but Americans tend to eat too much animal protein, which can be detrimental. It puts that heavy workload on the kidneys. Whereas plant-based foods have a natural alkali, which is kidney protective. So to me, a picture says a thousand words. And this graphic here is 
PRAL, the potential renal acid load, which associates between diet and acid-base balance, where if you look here at zero or less, that's more alkaline. Those are your fruits and vegetables. They're rich in alkali, whereas foods that are higher in dietary acid load would be your cheeses, eggs, meat, and, and poultry. So your pro tip is simply to balance your nutritional intake with ample fruits and vegetables to offset any animal intake. It'll create a more alkaline approach. The main reason we want fruits and vegetables is to fight inflammation. They are the powerhouse of you know, phytochemicals and antioxidants. And there's hundreds of studies that show evidence that fruits and vegetables protect against heart disease. And this is with a minimum of only five servings a day. That's it. Of course, we would love for everybody to eat much more than that, but sadly, most Americans don't take in even five. So if you can get to at least five servings a day, that's really amazing. And now we know that fruits and vegetables are not just heart protective, but they're kidney protective as well. Five a day is both fruit, is both kidney and cardio protective. Eat your veggies. This topic is one of my favorites, actually, we're talking about the gut and where plant foods actually offset the toxins in the gut, which we're learning more and more about every, every day. Healthcare providers are really learning that the central health of our body is in the gut. Uh, because plant-based foods actually shift our gut bacteria. And yes, we all have bacteria in our gut, but they shift the gut bacteria from an unhealthy, a proteolytic profile to a healthy, or what's called a sacrolytic profile. And what this does is it strengthens the gut. It helps increase those short chain fatty acids and it reduces inflammation, which is really important because when we do have kidney disease, we have increased inflammatory responses. So we do wanna lower inflammation as much as possible. And that helps with our heart as well. And all, overall, it helps improve our immune system. This healthy gut reduces the uremic toxins that we now know promote CKD. So all these long words, P-crucial sulfate, endoxyl sulfate, trimethylene M oxide, TMAO, which at one time we thought was merely uh, a toxin that is associated with the heart, but now we know it is also a renal toxin. All of these toxins are associated with animal protein intake. So if we can decrease the animal protein intake and increase the plants, we create a healthy gut. So now we're getting to what I really love to talk about, the minerals. And every time I talk about plant-based nutrition, most persons get a little bit wary because they feel that that might be too much potassium or it might be too much phosphorus. So we definitely want to touch on this. Phosphorus in regards to plants comes in the form of phytate or phytic acid. And we cannot really break this down very easily in our body. It needs to be hydrolyzed in order to be absorbed in our gut. Humans don't have a high amount of phytase. It's an enzyme that breaks down the phytate so that we can absorb it. So does this mean that we won't absorb the phosphorus? Not at all. We do break down our food in other ways. We do this through processing, such as high heat, soaking, fermentation, sprouting. Anytime we manipulate food items, we will make those, those nutrients more what is called bioavailable, and they will be more able to be absorbed. So that holds true with phosphorus and potassium is very similar, but it has nothing to do with an enzyme. It has to do with the plant cell walls. It has to do with the fiber, the plant matrix, if you will. If you think about it, think of a, a stalk of broccoli and then think of a tomato. A broccoli is very firm. It's very thick where a tomato is, it's juicy. So the potassium in the, in the tomato is gonna be much easier absorbed whereas the broccoli is higher fiber content and the potassium is not gonna be as readily absorbed. So the fiber is gonna slow the absorption and it'll be eliminated in the stool as far as potassium is concerned. So pro tip here, bioavailability is going to vary. We must think of how much is in the actual foods, but also how much is actually going to get absorbed. Fresh is best. So along those same thoughts, I wanna talk about organic versus inorganic. And this has nothing to do with shopping for organic produce. It has to do with, is it a natural food source or is it an unnatural food source? 
Our natural food sources are animals or plants. Our unnatural are commercially prepared, ready to eat foods that have additives. So if we think about it in animal and plant foods, in our dairy foods, fresh meat, seafood, poultry, the phosphorus is gonna be absorbed about 50% or more, up to 80% in milk. Why? Milk has no fiber. So of course, it's gonna be absorbed much easier. Where if we look at grains, vegetables, nuts, legumes, beans, it's going to be a much lower absorption, 50% or less, as low as 10%, although I highly doubt it's going to be that low because we're usually going to cook our food. And then also, too, if we're using plant sources for our protein, it's, it's not going to have the additives that are now used with meat processing. But a word of caution on that, if we're using commercially prepared plant-based proteins, then they are going to have uh, additives, which brings me to the additive or preservatives. Ready to eat, enhanced meats, those have additives that are going to be absorbed almost 100%. So the pro tip is to eat fresh, check your labels, which that survey showed that virtually everyone wants to check their labels. That's pretty exciting to me. And if it's not natural, then avoid it. Just to give you an idea of some plant sources of protein, look to your left. There are some examples. And then I just wanted to highlight how much phosphorus might be bioavailable in regards to absorption. How much is actually going to be absorbed? Let's look at tofu for a minute. Tofu, three and a half ounces, that gives 17 grams. And how much did I say we want to take in at a meal? I had said earlier, maybe 10 to 15 grams. We don't want to go higher than that if we have CKD stages three to five, not on dialysis. So you want to be cautious with that. If we were on dialysis, then that would be okay. We could take in much more than that. And then looking across, that would be about 190 milligrams of phosphorus, but not all of that will be absorbed because it's a plant-based. But let's look at an example of an animal-based protein, such as roast beef. So three and a half ounces, you can see the phosphorus absorption is gonna be much higher as is the protein source as well. So we have to look at how much is actually in our foods, which leads me to the labels. I love the fact that everyone's looking at labels. It's so exciting to me because the tried and true way of looking for phosphorus is looking for the PHOS. It is virtually the only way we're gonna find out if there's added phosphorus to foods. And we're not going to see those in the nutrition facts. We'll see it in the ingredients. So if you look at the label on your left, you're going to see there is no phosphorus in this, in this food product. But if you look in the label to your right, you're going to see in these ingredients, sodium hexamidophosphate. There is no extensive studies that say that this is actually safe for us. We also see potassium sorbate, phosphoric acid, we see more potassium, more calcium, and you can also see that I blocked out the names of the brand because I don't want to have a lawsuit. So when we look at all of these uh, ingredients, we might think, hmm, might not be a good choice. So keep that in mind when you're looking at labels. So going down that same path, is it natural or unnatural, it's the same thing with fluid. And we must remember to keep ourselves adequately hydrated. It's very important especially in earlier stages of kidney disease, we want to make sure that we're drinking ample, ample fluid. And what do we need naturally? We need water. And our bodies will tell us when we're thirsty. But if we do have kidney disease, our bodies might not be sending us the right thirst signals and the fluid may not get processed the same. So we have to be cognizant of what is our number. In stages one, two, or three, the kidneys can still regulate fluid. And in stages four or five, it starts to diminish a little bit more, especially when we're on dialysis. The kidneys are not able to process salt and extra water. And at some point on dialysis, they will not at all. So this is where your dietitian and your doctor will definitely give you guidance as to how much you can actually take in. But when it comes to inorganic or unnatural, avoid all these flavored and sugary drinks, these flavored drinks often have all of those additives. Now, all those pretty colors, it's not natural. That's what we don't need. So avoid that. Look at your labels and see what is actually in that. Drink when you're thirsty and drink water. That's your pro tip. If it's not natural, avoid it. And if you're on a fluid restriction, all fluid counts. Water, tea, ice, jello, popsicles, 
when it melts, it's fluid, it counts. So I love to I love to have fun, and I thought let's do something fun here. So it's something similar I used to do uh, years ago. It's called beverage beverage lineup, and think about what is safer. So here I have a sports water, and I did block out the name brands again. I don't want problems, and then I have a clear soda, fifty uh, lemon lime soda zero calories and then let's see which one is actually safer so for our our sports water we can see sodium hexametaphosphate <sighs> again with these additives potassium sorbet um more potassium more sodium this probably wouldn't be a good choice let's see what's good about our soda here we can see potassium potassium and potassium this is probably the lesser of the two evils. However, it probably wouldn't be the best choice either. Regular water is truly what you need. And holiday times or special times, we might want to splurge. We might want to have something special and make a little bit of a spritzer with a small amount. It's not detrimental, but I would not drink this on a daily basis. Again, organic or inorganic, natural or unnatural. I, a low protein diet that is plant-based is low sodium, which will help with blood pressure. It reduces your CKD risk. It also decreases risk of heart disease, stroke, and for persons who are on dialysis, it helps to improve fluid management and blood pressure. Here I have two examples of soup side by side. This label to your left is a regular can of soup, 680 milligrams, and the low sodium soup is literally half 340 milligrams my point is not every day is a perfect day we may eat something that's from the can ready to eat ready made but choose lower always try to choose as low as possible there is an increased popularity with modified plant proteins or fake meats is it natural is it safe it's not natural it's a modified food so it's what i call a sometimes food is it safe well, it's, it's going to have additives in it. It's processed food. So we must learn to look at the labels. It will have potassium, phosphorus, and salt. So this is a sometimes food that's okay now and then. We'll have to learn how to be label scrutineers. This was very hard for me during one of my pregnancies. I like to give my own stories as examples. And I had uh, crazy blood pressure. I was swelling. And I had to follow a low sodium diet. And I found how hard it is for the patients that I consult when I was looking at every single label that had unbelievably high sodium. And I felt like, what is there left to eat? It's very difficult when we start looking at these labels, but we need to toss the shape shaker and find out what herbs and spices can we flavor our foods with instead. And I like this one milligram sodium to one calorie rule, the one to one rule it helps keep sodium in check. It's not always easy, but it helps give us a little bit of guidance. Let's look at some labels. On your first label to your left, we can see the calories are 210 and the sodium is 190. Is this actually safe? Think about that. The 190 is definitely less than a 210. So yes, it is safe. Let's look at our next label. The calories are 400 and the sodium is 1,030. Is this safe? Absolutely not. <laughs> this is half of the sodium intake for the entire day. And this probably isn't going to do us any good. It's very high in fat too. Let's look at the last label, 270 calories and the sodium is 240. Is this safe? Yes, it is safe. It's less than 270. Is every day going to be a perfect day? No, but we can strive to try to keep it as best as we can. In regards to potassium, years ago when I started to work with kidney disease, the potassium restriction was really pretty horrifying. It was very, very strict. But now with the new guidelines, it simply states, adjust dietary potassium intake to maintain serum potassium in the normal range. There is a lot of growing evidence that show that plant-based dash Mediterranean diets delays the progression uh, to ESKD and helps to improve survival. So I do encourage, if anything, for anyone actually to at least follow the Mediterranean diet and try to use as much plants as possible. The key here is that plants that are very high in fiber, that's the key, the, the higher the fiber, the better, 
the fiber increases potassium ex excretion in the stool. So higher fiber is better. In regards to high potassium or hyperkalemia, the concerns may seem a little overinflated. They are realistic. And it's usually plant-based uh, foods that are the culprits, sadly. And it's usually juices, sauces, or dry fruits. Oftentimes, well-meaning family or persons, say in nursing homes, they might give their patients or their family members orange juice to help with low blood sugar. Well, orange juice has no fiber. So of course it's gonna you know, promote a higher potassium level. So we need to understand what better sources are low potassium for those types of situations. And then know that whenever we're choosing foods that are higher in potassium, think in terms of what is the fiber content because that's what makes the difference. There was an article years ago that stated the top five sources of potassium in our patients' diets were beef, chicken, Mexican food, hamburgers, and legumes. But what we have to understand is that when we're looking at food lists of high potassium foods, it's almost always fruits and vegetables. Meats are rarely on those lists. So we have to be cognizant that meats are also high in potassium, meats and dairies. I want to talk about dyskusia just for a moment. Uh, this is such a funny word, but it simply means an unpleasant or altered taste. It's very common in persons that have CKD and this causes changes in taste, might not detect sodium or food might have a, a bitter taste or a metallic taste. And there's uh, things that can be done to help correct that, such as correcting imbalances, correction of uremia, toxins, resolving deficiencies, vitamin or mineral deficiencies, using a more alkali diet. What I found to be very beneficial is to avoid trigger foods. Avoid cooking odors that you know set those triggers off. For me, the smell of meat is a trigger. I can't stand the smell of meat cooking, especially sausage. It just If I smell it, it stays with me. And any food I eat, I feel like I'm tasting that. So if you have experienced that, then if you can have someone else cook the food and then join when it's cooled off, because if it's cooled off or cold, it's much better tolerated that way. If you haven't been to a dentist in a long while, then I would suggest to go because if you have an infection or a, a dental carry, then that can affect how your food might taste too. So we talked a lot about what is important in the kidney diet, but how does it all fit? A couple of years ago, Dr. Shoshi included this guideline, which shows how many servings of foods can be safely included each day, such as two to four servings of fruits, five servings of non-starchy vegetables, two servings of whole grains, three servings of legumes or beans, and two to three servings of nuts or seeds. And when we look at that, we might think, my gosh, that is going to be super high in potassium and phosphorus, but it's a balancing act. We also must take in note the foods to exclude, such as fruit juices, processed foods, meat and dairy, which we know are high in potassium. It's a balancing act. Many of my patients, when they have started to include more plant-based, they got themselves in a spot of trouble because they weren't balancing it appropriately. If you add plants, you must take out something. So if you're including beans, then you must decrease the meat. That's the balance. And the, the portion sizes, knowing the servings, that's the key. And when we transition to a plant-based diet, and I strongly encourage this method of transitioning for persons on dialysis, is to start gradually with just one meal a week, one plant-based meal a week, and then gradually increase to a day, one plant-based Based meal a day. This gives an opportunity to work with your dietitian to see if there's any discrepancies, any changes in your blood in your blood work. And I always encourage a journal. Write down what you're eating and even the portion sizes if you if you can, or estimate it at least, or take a picture of it with your phone and show your dietitian. You know, this is what I had. But this helps to pinpoint what might have been the troublemaker that caused the labs to go awry. But these incremental changes, they're much easier to manage. And it, oftentimes patients ask me, well, what can I eat? What is your favorite foods? What are your favorite recipes? Let's not reinvent the wheel, but let's just simply trade off ingredients and make it plant-based. It's very easy to do. But even small baby steps make significant changes. So when I'm teaching 
patients, I like to use different types of plates so that they can see that there's a wide variety of foods such as these plant-based uh, plates. But I like to also include uh, plates that are lacto-ovo because some people still want to, of course, enjoy dairy and milk, uh, dairy and eggs, sorry. I myself follow a very strict plant-based diet, but not everybody's on that same food journey. And we have to be very realistic and know that not everyone eats the same. So we have to think, you know, what I call globally. So remember that that uh, guideline that Dr. Joshi had with all the listings of foods that can be safely put in a day. I expanded that a little bit to help my patients. So on the left is the servings of day that we would typically have, then what it would look like for a person that has CKD. This would be based on stage three to five, not on dialysis, and then sample foods or servings. So that makes it a lot easier because it's so hard to guesstimate, well, what does that even equal? Um, and then a little bit of notes and tips, but I love to keep it very simple. I love the 50, 25, 25 rule where half the plate is vegetables, a quarter is grains and a quarter or less is protein. Protein needs to be really trimmed down. That will keep your kidneys as healthy as possible. I even have to keep a log to, to maintain my protein just to track. I found that even I was eating a little bit more protein than I should and I don't eat meat at all. So patients ask me, well, that's all well and good, but do you have a menu? That's the first thing I get asked every time. So just give you some ideas of what types of foods you can safely include. Here are some breakfast sources, always including a cereal day because some days are hectic and we don't have time to cook. Some days we might want to cook some pancakes and then breakfast burritos. And then for lunch, I have included veggie pasta salad, pita bread with hummus, and then I always have a sandwich day for the same reason that we may not have time to cook. We may not have time to pack a big lunch if we need to pack up. So this is a good quick fix. And then beans and rice, which is my favorite day. And then for dinner, items such as vegetarian tacos, fried rice, garden burger, because some, some people miss their hamburgers. So I think it's fair enough. Fajitas with tortillas is so good. But when I give these menus, it's usually five days and it's a broad variety of foods so we can mix and match. And what it comes down to is 35 to 46 grams of protein, which is really safe for almost anybody. So we're going to talk about a patient that I had. This is not his real name. I'm just calling him Stan. So this patient, um, he did have heart disease. He had diabetes. He had kidney disease. And if you want, you can type in a uh, chat what you think about some of the things that we could do uh, for Stan. His BMI was on, on high side. So was his blood sugar, his lipids, his GFR was 43. What is his stage kidney disease when it's 43? So I'll tell you about Stan. He let his spouse left him about seven years ago. He dines out frequently. He doesn't mind cooking. He actually likes it and he's very motivated. He's been Googling how to best improve his health. He's said he's trying to become a vegetarian or a vegan. His ultimate goal is no medications. He doesn't want medications and he doesn't want dialysis. He doesn't have a high activity level, but he does enjoy bowling and fishing. So brainstorm on what you think is best for Stan. We'll come back to him in a few minutes. There are barriers to good nutrition. Now, I've shared a few things about myself with you and I don't mind sharing at all. That's part of life. At one time in my world, I did not have a home. A couple times in my life, I did not have a vehicle. For a couple of years, I lived on only $250 or less with four children. It was extremely difficult. So I understand how very difficult it is to have access to good food or to even live close enough to a store that offers good choices. That's often a problem too. So we have to be cognizant as healthcare providers when we're talking to patients and identifying how can we be versatile in educating our patients and finding some sources that can help? Or how can we tailor the diet that's going to be applicable and help them? We have to be innovative and tailor. We have to seek partnerships such as local food banks, farmers markets, community gardens are getting very, very popular, community-based centers, and all of us together need to advocate for policies to dismantle health inequities. 
That is a given. That is all the time. And I urge healthcare providers to always screen for food insecurity. Avoid using standard healthy plates. No one eats the same. And it's, it's rather insulting. We have to think outside the box and think, what do our patients actually want? It has to be all about them. I urge healthcare providers, think in terms of uh, the patient's shoes. Some of the healthy plates that I've been using come from the vegetarian diet practice group because they are focusing on traditional cuisines. They have um, cooking demos and the plates, both culture plates and culture kitchen. So it's really exciting to share something like this with patients so that they can see all the variety and delicious foods that they can actually enjoy. But of course, it comes with some knowledge of what is higher in fiber so they can make good choices. We have to consider cost, availability, access, and ease of preparation and storage. Do our patients have adequacy in storage as well? We don't have a lot of time to talk about managing blood sugar, but I do want to point this out because we talked about organic versus inorganic or natural versus unnatural, and that holds true with grains as well. The more processing, the greater the nutrient loss. So choosing nutrients that are higher on this whole grain hierarchy are more helpful. These grains have a higher fiber content and they don't cause higher spikes in blood sugar as well, such as those that you would see with processed white bread, um, processed grains. Okay, we're going back to Stan. He has established some goals and he also has concerns. He's asked for a plant-based meal plan. He's having difficulty going 100% vegan and he's concerned about the amount and types of protein. He's having difficulty walking distances. He states his legs feel weak. He has also difficulty cooking all of his meals and he does enjoy dining out. The, his doctor prescribed him a statin and he was, he was upset about that, but he decided that he would take the statin, but he declined any intervention, no pills for his diabetes. He does have two children and one adult child does live nearby and is involved. Think about what interventions might be a good focus for Stan and we're going to come back and then I bet you're going to be on the same track of what we did. When we think about all those interventions for Stan, what we're doing is we're digging into problem solving. We're brainstorming to expand our choices. We're helping to form an action plan and I urge patients don't be afraid to ask for help. When you're talking to your dietitian or your health healthcare provider, what foods are your favorites? See if they can be worked in. Of the foods that you discuss, what foods might be those that you want to fit into your day? What types of protein sources do you want to include in your day? What vegetables or grains do you think you want to try? It would be exciting to try just even one new one each week. Even starting small makes a big difference. Create cues or reminders in your daily routine to help you stay on track with both medication and, and nutrition. Example, I have to line up literally my water for the day or I will get so busy I'll forget to drink water. So I have to line up. And that used to not be the case. I used to drink water like crazy, but I have to keep myself on track. I put reminders in my phone to help me remember to exercise more, to get up away from my desk more. So it, it's okay to set up reminders. It's keeping yourself on track. It's not a failure. You're helping yourself succeed. This is why I like this patient-centered care plan. First, we assess. We talk about the patient's beliefs and knowledge about their kidney disease. And then healthcare providers advise. They provide education on the health risks and the benefits of change. And then comes the agree. This is a collaboration. This is where patients set goals based on what do they feel they can do? What is their interest? And what is their confidence in what they really truly want? And then comes assist. This is what we just did or looked at with Stan, where we're looking at barriers and strategies, problem solving. We're looking at social environment support. Is any needs not met that we can tap into? And then comes a range. A range is the fun part to me. This is where we have a follow-up action plan. Who's going to be involved? What's going to be involved? What is it going to entail? What are we going to look at? What's working? What's not working? What are we going to do to fix it? It's, to me, more fun because it's, it's action. Okay, we're checking in with Stan. This is three months later. He's been able to minimize his animal protein intake. 
he didn't go vegan and that's fine. The meal plan he's following is the Plato diet and he's up to about 75% plant protein, which is pretty good. And he continues to dine out twice a week. So what we did was we reviewed menus and we pulled up every restaurant menu that he liked to eat out at. And I gave him the best choices for each restaurant. He's okay with his current plan, but he's getting bored. He feels like he's eating the same thing over and over again. The dining out tips have indeed helped. And he's actually getting out every day. He's taking 10 minute walks. He felt that maybe that wasn't enough, but I applaud that. And some days he's actually doing that twice a day. Even 10 minutes is, it's more than zero minutes. So that's a great start. We uh, looked at some alternate exercise activities and he's actually going to enroll, or he did enroll with a plant-based culinary class with his daughter. So it was pretty exciting. His BMI started trending down, his A1C was getting better the statin was doing its job, and so was his diet actually. And six months later, his GFR was checked and it was 46. If we think about it, what might his long-term goals look like? I would say to continue as is, he's on the right track. So ultimately, following a low protein diet consisting of plant-based foods can be kidney protective. It does meet nutrition needs. It is favorable in, in preserving kidneys, but not only that, it helps with hypertension, diabetes, heart disease. It helps keep your gut healthy. It decreases uremic toxins that we know are dangerous to our kidneys. They promote kidney damage. And ultimately, what it comes down to is what's best for the patient. Uh, where and what do they want to do? That's ultimately uh, the route that needs to be taken because everyone is on a different food journey. And that is it for today. We have time for questions. Hey, Anna Marie, thank you for that great presentation. I, I hope you can stick around for a little bit because we have a few questions from members of our audience that we'd like to ask you after our, our next speaker. Uh, I now like to introduce Janice Sterling. Janice is a dedicated, dedicated educator and advocate for kidney disease awareness. She was a dialysis patient for over 13 years before she received a kidney transplant in 2013. Her, past, her personal experience inspired her to become an AAK, AAKP ambassador in an effort to educate and support others facing similar challenges. Janice is also a part of her family's business. She works as an educator at a daycare center and is committed to nurturing a love of knowledge in children and her fellow kidney warriors. Janice is also the founder of the All Kidney Patient Support Group based in Florida, which provides education and advocacy for kidney patients within her local community. Janice, thanks for being with us today to respond to a few questions about what it's like to follow a kidney-friendly diet, and the work your support group does to help feed and educate people in your community about the importance of following a renal diet when faced with kidney disease. So to start with, what type of education did you receive that helped you understand what it means to eat kidney friendly? Wow, Jerome, Miss mm. Rodriguez just did an excellent job um, with the kidney friendly diet. Some of the educations that I chose was the internet, um, the AAKP um, website. We also use the AAKP um, meal plans that we have here. And this meal tells you if you have CKD, dialysis, di uh, or diabetes, or a kidney transplant. So this is one of the, some of the menus that I use when we do our food drive and also to educate myself on how to eat a kidney friendly diet. One of the things that she said is that when you first, when you're on dialysis, you have a different meal. So your, your dialysis nurse talks to you, the, the uh, dietitian talks to you. Then once you get a kidney transplant, you hit another di a dietitian, she has to talk to you about how to eat at stage one. And as you want to try to stay at stage one, if you go to stage two, you have a different plan, stage three, stage four. So hopefully you don't want to go back on dialysis, but you 
definitely have to monitor each stage at um, educate yourself on the stage that you're on. So that's what I did. But basically the internet and AAKP. To answer so was it, yeah. So was it difficult for you to follow a kidney friendly diet? Yes, it's very difficult. That's why I appreciate what Ms. Rodriguez says because just a couple of weeks ago, I was in the doctor's office and, and he was saying, oh, you need to eat protein. It's like, but I'm leaking protein. And he said, that's not the same protein. And it's like, well, how is that? I mean, how is the meat that I'm eating not the same protein that's coming out? So it it, it gets a little confusing, but Ms. Rodriguez just definitely explained it to me in a way that I can understand. And, um, and it's to better help my kidney is more plant-based. So you have some people say, oh, you need to eat meat. Then somebody say, oh, you don't, you, you need to eat meat, but just don't eat so much. Then somebody say, oh, you can't be plant-based, but you, you know, so it's so many different areas and so many different professionals telling you, you know, then I, I, I drawn a gifted program. I said, well, let me get in a diet program to try to help me to control my eating habits. And then they have the plate, you know, and they say, you're supposed to have this much. And this much protein and it's like well i can't eat that much protein that seems too much so it it, it does become difficult for a individual at different stages to figure out what stage or what they should be eating it can be a little difficult uh, yes yes i uh, i hear that a lot um i understand that uh the support group that you founded conducts several kidney friendly food drives throughout the year can you tell us more about these events and why do you do them? Well, it started due to COVID. We started, we noticed that a lot of the patients with the salt and the pork, and they just had not a clue on how to season their vegetables to make them taste good. And trying to teach them that you don't have to, in the African-American community, you don't have to use a lot of pork and um, a lot of beef and a lot of pork too. So we started doing cooking demonstrations. We started February with the soul food meal in 2019. And then COVID hit. Once COVID hit, we was like, well, how are we gonna um, help the patients to understand that they still need to eat right? So we started a kidney friendly food drive. Well, that started out with having, cause it was a local, uh, the Daystar Life Center and they do meals, um, they already give out meals to the community, to the homeless community. So their idea was to give them food. And I was like, oh, I can't give them tomatoes, you know, because tomato sauce, uh, a basic homeless meal consists of canned food, canned meat, uh, tomato sauce, if you're going to get a meal plan, tomato sauce, ground beef, um, pasta, mashed potatoes, something easy to cook. So I had to educate the, the, the Daystar Life Center first, what is a kidney friendly food? You know, uh, we need food that's not high in sodium. We need fresh vegetables. It's easy to go and say, here's a can of string beans. But if you flip the, the label over and you see how much salt in the string beans, then it's like, oh, we need low sodium string beans. Then low sodium is so hard to find, it was hard to get those. So then we went to fresh string beans. So it, it was an education process that took, took us almost a year to, to, to get the, the center to say, we can't eat tomato sauce, but you know, if we do tomatoes, it gotta be a cherry and it can't be every month. You know, we have to change it up each month. So it took a little education and bringing in a, 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 a renal grocery list educating them on a kidney friendly diet. I took the menu. So what I did, I take the menu here and I'll say, well, this menu calls for turkey. So we need turkey, we need um, onions, we need uh, bell peppers. And those are the items that we'll put into the box. So it, it took a little doing, but we pretty much got it down now. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's that's really cool. Uh, about how many families are your food drives able to help? Uh, and what's the feedback like from the people that receive food? Okay, the, we started out with 40 in 2019. 
December, we had over 110 families. And, oh, it was, it was, it was, it was really something to have all those boxes and the people come through. And right now, last, we just did our food drive yesterday and we had 75 families that came through. When we pack our boxes, we do a little different from the, uh, the, the local community. We pack the boxes according to the family sizes. So on our website, the family members, they go and sign up. I have a relationship with the, all of the local di dialysis centers in the area. I send, give flyers to the dialysis centers. They go on our website and register and we ask them what size family they have. If the largest family we've had was a family of 10 and we put the items in there per family so that each family member can have, like if we have 10 apples, we'll give the family 10 apples. If a family of one, we'll give them two apples so we're not wasting the food. So that's usually how we pack our boxes. But the most we ever served was 125 families. Each oh, wow, month is 75. Yeah. Well, that's still a lot of families. Uh, so thank you. Uh, one, one more thing. One more thing. What are a few tips you can give us that people should keep in mind if they want to organize a food drive? Um, the first thing is to get in touch with your local community who's already doing a food drive. That's kind of what I did. And I went to them and I told them there is a need. And from there, I educated them on the the, the a kidney friendly diet and kind of encourage them because we have our monthly meetings there. And from there, it's like, talk to your local food banks, kind of get them used to, you know, what a kidney friendly diet is and the, and the process, what it takes. Of course, it does take a lot of money. So you will have to um, research grants. And uh, we did the same thing. We had a, um, a local grant that was that was doing COVID that supplied us with enough money to take care of 100 families each month. And basically that's what it, it does, is getting to know your community, the food drive, getting to know your dialysis centers in your local area, and then having a relationship with the social workers and your ESRD network, that's another source to, uh, to tap into because that way with the ESRD network, they're able to talk to the social workers and send the flyers out, most of them. Thank you, Janice. Uh, you you're doing amazing work, so uh, and we appreciate you. So thank you, Janice, for sharing part of thank your you. kidney journey and the work of the All Kidney Patient Support Group. We do have a few questions for Anna Marie from our audience that I would like to ask her. Uh, Anna Marie, again, we appreciate your time. No problem, so, no problem. First, I'm going to applaud Janice. I absolutely love what she's saying and what she's doing, and it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So uh, one of the biggest takeaways from our program is that there is no one size fits all kidney diet. Many factors may no. impact no. what is recommended to a patient. So our first question addresses that and asks, what are a few main differences uh, patients may face when trying to eat kidney friendly if they are early stage kidney disease versus dialysis versus having mm -hmm. a kidney transplant? It's a super question and one that I deeply appreciate because, as you said, there is, there's no one size fits all. It's not a cookie cutter. Kidney disease is not a cookie cutter. As Janice pointed out, there's a difference between each stage. Each stage has different needs and then comes uh, the point where someone may need dialysis. There's different needs there. And then once someone gets a transplant, there's different needs there. So. We must think broad strokes in terms of what's needed, but protein is ultimately the one item that does fluctuate a lot. Uh, low sodium, clear across the board, uh, high fiber, clear across the board, but sodium, uh, it will help with every facet, even with transplant. But protein, when you hit stages three to five, even stage two, I think it's very vital. And I think that this stage is often overlooked because at that point, if it's detected, we can do so much more to prevent the continuation of the damage to the kidney. Why wait until stage three before there's more damage? So between those stages though, 
protein restriction is vitally important. And uh, Janice brought up a very good point about, well, how much protein? What kind of protein? What, what makes a difference? So we talked about many of those different facets. You can go you know, several different ways for persons that want to enjoy still animal sources of protein, then keeping in mind, it's gonna be, it's gonna be very minimal. You know, only three to five ounces a day, depending on body size. And a rule of thumb, 10 grams, 10 to 15 grams, depending on body size again, each meal would be a limit. But once someone is on dialysis, then those protein needs go up. They almost double. So for someone who's on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, then those protein needs do indeed increase. That's almost, you know, eight ounces. So I've seen some of my patients having even higher needs than that. Uh, but what we need to think about also is I talked a lot about fruits and vegetables and choosing those vegetables and fruits that have high fibers so that we don't have as high of a potassium load. But between dialysis, this is a, a facet to keep in mind too. Whether someone's on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis will determine how much potassium intake is necessary too. Persons that are on peritoneal dialysis will typically need more potassium in their diet because they're dialyzing basically every single day. So those needs change. And then when persons have a transplant, immediately following transplant, the, the protein and calorie needs are very high right after the surgery for healing. But once that graft takes place, then the diet is pretty much equivalent to the average person. But what I would venture to say is to go um, moderate and keep in mind that the average person only needs six to eight grams per kilogram of protein a day. So I think this is where in America we are going wrong. We're ingesting much more higher amounts of protein than what we actually need. And so using that Play-Doh approach would be very beneficial for someone who has had a transplant because it's more kidney protective. And you want to protect that kidney at all costs. Now, so low sodium, high fiber, and adequate fruits and vegetables. Yeah. And hydration. Yeah. <laughs> hydration is key, but not on dialysis. Lower the volume. <laughs> so uh, is it true that individuals on home dialysis, on a home dialysis therapy, such as peritoneal dialysis or home hemo, often have fewer dietary modifications? If so, Absolutely. can you explain why? Yes, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking because this, it goes in line with what we were just talking about. Like there is no cookie cutter. So we must think in terms of those broad strokes there again, in, in thinking also that not every person is exactly the same. Some people will have higher needs than others. Some persons have other comorbidities that will also play a role in to what they need in their diet. But for persons that are on home hemodialysis or home peritoneal dialysis, they're dialyzing every single day. Home hemo, they're going to dialyze four to seven times a day or a week, sorry. Uh, so they're going to get their blood cleared out. Whereas in center dialysis is only three times a week, some four times a week, but generally it's three times a week. So you have this every other day where the toxins in uremia is going to build up. So by the time you get back to dialysis, you're, you know, getting all cleaned up and ready to go again, and you're going to build back up for two days, and then you have that space of the weekend. So if you're on home hemo, then you have, uh, basically, you're getting your blood cleaned every day. And thus, there's so much more liberalization in the diet. You still need a little bit more protein because, thinking about this, that kidney disease in itself is inflammatory. Dialysis process is inflammatory. So to combat that, we need a little bit more protein. So yeah, definitely home is the way to go. All right, thank you, Anna Marie and Janice. You're we welcome. appreciate all the feedback that you guys provided today. Uh, and we appreciate you sharing your expertise and experiences. If anyone watching has additional questions for our speakers or about today's webinar that we were unable to get to, please email us at info at aakp.org, noting the webinar, webinar title in the email subject line. And be sure to mark your calendar for National High Potassium Awareness Day on May 1st. It's crucial for people living with kidney disease to understand potassium and be mindful of their potassium intake. 
the safe range for potassium levels is considered to be under 5.1. So it's important to be aware of your potassium intake and make sure you stay within a healthy range. Visit www.ruok.org to learn more about National High Potassium Awareness Day and all the great resources AAKP has available. In closing, if you are not already a member of AAKP, we encourage you to, to join. AAKP offers free membership to patients and their family members, as well as living kidney donors. To become a free member, join online at aakp.org forward slash join or by phone at 1-800-749-2257. To receive all the benefits of membership, please be sure to include your email address when signing up. As an AAKP member, you will be notified about all of our all of AAKP's upcoming events, the latest in our educational program series, and when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the independent patient voice and change status quo kidney care. You will also receive a digital subscription to our bi-monthly magazine, AAKP Renal Life, and can select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters, all for just signing up. We also invite you to check our, our blog to read some great articles and patient profile stories and follow us on social media for all the latest news and to keep up on what's trending. AAKP is dedicated to helping kidney patients across the disease spectrum understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and care partners. By visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the AAKP store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download free of charge, including titles such as Nutrition Counter, a reference guide for the kidney patient, available in English and Spanish, and Pocket Guide to Managing High Potassium, as well as the AKP Understanding Food Nutrition Fact Labels brochure. You can also order materials by phone. Did you know AKP created a recipe series program to support those affected by kidney disease? It's called AKP Delicious. It includes more than 100 kidney-friendly recipes developed to help you cook healthy, delicious meals that fit your kidney diet, whether you're a patient or a family member, in your effort to take charge of your health care through nutrition. Our sixth and seventh editions of AKB Delicious include short, on-demand cooking demos of all the recipes that you can easily follow along. Recipe ingredients can be modified to fit your specific needs. Be sure to, co to consult your renal dietitian if you have any questions on how to incorporate any of AKP's recipes into your daily diet. Purchase all seven editions of AKP Delicious and start your collection today. AKP has a number of exciting events planned for 2024, including our sixth annual Global Summit on Kidney Disease Innovations, hosted in partnership with the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, which will take place virtually July 16th and 17th. Our seventh annual policy summit is scheduled to take place November 20th at the National Press Club in Washington, DC, and will also include, also include for virtual participation. Registration for both events is now open. And AAKP's 49th annual national patient meeting will be a hybrid event using AAKP's sophisticated virtual event platform with the in-person component taking place in September and the beautiful state of Florida. The dates are to be announced. And finally, you can also visit our YouTube channel to watch a number of great presentations and webinars, all available on demand from our 2023 events and programs, as well as 2024 programs as they occur. 
Again, thank you, Anna Marie Rodriguez and Janice Starling for participating in today's AAKP Healthline webinar. We appreciate everyone's time and expertise in helping to make this event meaningful and informative. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.